argument basics. Now, first thing we'll look at here is the notion of an argument. Now, in everyday life, if someone tells you they've had an argument with someone, you'd probably infer from that they've had a fight, a dispute, a disagreement, perhaps an exchange of harsh words. Now, in philosophy, the definition of argument is somewhat more technical. It's not a fight, a dispute, a disagreement. It is, in this context, a set of claims, one of which is supposed to be supported or follow from the others. Now, a claim is a statement that can be true or false, and it can be any such statement. It could range from something fairly minor, like today is Saturday, to something much more controversial and debated, such as God exists, or the United States should engage in military action in Syria, or gun ownership should be banned in the United States. Those are all claims. Now, when you make an argument, what you're presenting is a claim that is supposed to be supported by the other claims being presented. Now, the claim that's being argued for, supported, is known as the conclusion. And an argument can have one and only one conclusion. Now, to find the conclusion of an argument, you ask the question, what is the point? What is a person trying to prove? What are they trying to establish? Now, if a person has a point, that doesn't automatically make it an argument. For example, if a person says, gun ownership should not be allowed in the United States anymore in light of the terrible you know, gun violence, they've got a point, but they don't have an argument, because they're missing the other part. The other part is the support supposedly being offered for this conclusion. Now, the support being offered individually is known as a premise, or collectively as premises. A premise is a claim given as evidence or reason for accepting the conclusion. Now, an argument can only have one conclusion, but there's no limit, at least in theory, on the number of premises an argument may have. So what we have is basically this. An argument consists of one claim, known as a conclusion, which is supposed to be supported by or follow from the others, which provide the evidence or reasons, which are known as premises. Now arguments divide into two main flavors. Three if you want to throw in a bad flavor. The first is what's known as an inductive argument. It's an argument which deals in probability. To be a little clearer, it's an argument in which the premises are intended to provide some degree of support for the conclusion, but less than complete support. So they deal in probability. To use a simple example, suppose we take as premise 1, a percent of humans have brown eyes, and you conclude the next person you meet will have brown eyes. In that case, that would be inductive reasoning, because in that case you're likely to be right, but not guaranteed. Now the second main flavor is what is known as a deductive argument. It's an argument in which the premises are intended to provide complete support for the conclusion. To give a simple example, take the following argument. Premise 1. If today is Saturday, then tomorrow is Sunday. Premise 2. Today is Saturday. Conclusion. Tomorrow is Sunday. Now, of course, assuming that today is Saturday, and assuming Sunday follows Saturday, the probability of the conclusion is, well, guaranteed. Now, the third flavor is known as a fallacy. A fallacy is an argument in which the premises fail to adequately support the conclusion. It's a bad argument. It's a mistake in reasoning. Now, people often misuse the term fallacy and take it to mean the same thing as a factual error. A factual error is being wrong about the facts. A fallacy is being mistaken in one's reasoning. To use kind of a crappy analogy, you can compare it to like doing one's checkbook. There's you know, two ways one can go wrong. One could write down like the wrong amount for a check, which would be like a factual error, putting down the incorrect amount. A person could also do their math wrong, which would be like committing a fallacy, engaging in you know, bad reasoning. Now, there are both inductive and deductive fallacies. Now, when you're trying to build an argument, say for the paper, or assessing an argument, say also for the paper, 
There are essentially two main questions to consider in regards to assessing it. The first one involves the reasoning, and the question is this. Do the premises logically support the conclusion? The way you tell this is based on the type of argument you've got, if the argument is deductive or inductive. Now, in the case of deductive arguments, the question is, is the argument valid or invalid? Now, validity tends to throw people off quite a bit, because it's a conditional sort of thing. Now, an argument is valid means that if the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. Now, interestingly or boringly enough, an argument could be valid, yet have premises that are not true. It could even have a conclusion that's not true, provided the premises are all not true. The only thing you couldn't have would be an argument that's valid with all true premises and a false conclusion. Now, this might seem kind of odd, but the idea basically is this. We can reason well about things that are not true. And I'll give two sort of illustrations of this. First, considering the following example. Premise one. If Bill is a unicorn, then Bill is a horn. Premise two. Bill is a unicorn. Conclusion, Bill has a horn. Now, of course, we know there are no unicorns, but if there were unicorns, and if a unicorn had to have a horn, then it would follow that if unicorns, you know, have horns and Bill's unicorn, the reasoning would be such that you conclude that Bill has a horn. But sadly, there are no unicorns. They all died of smoking, believing their magical horns would protect them, and boy, they were wrong. Same thing happened to dinosaurs. So don't smoke, or you'll be as dead as a unicorn. Now, another way to illustrate this is think about if you were taking a class like in business, and you're learning how to calculate a mortgage, for example, or interest rates. Now, in doing that, in order to do your math wrong correctly, your reasoning, you don't have to actually go out and like get a mortgage to make it true, but you can do your math correctly. That is, reason well about things that are made up for the purposes of the class. So the reasoning is one thing, the quality of the reasoning. And again, a valid argument is such that if all the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. Now, the opposite of a valid argument is the invalid argument. It's one in, in which all the premises could be true, but the conclusion could be false at the same time. So all true premises could lead to a false conclusion. And that's bad. Now, in some cases, this can be obvious. In other cases, though, the invalid argument seems very appealing. For example, premise one. If Tallahassee is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida, which is true. Premise two, Tallahassee is in Florida, which is also true. Conclusion, Tallahassee is the capital of Florida, which happens to be true. So everything I said is true, and it seems to make sense. However, the argument is a bad argument. Why? Well, let's take an argument with the same exact reasoning and see how it works out. Premise one. If Sop Choppy is in the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida. Premise two, Sop Choppy is in Florida, which is true. Conclusion, Sop Choppy is the capital of, of Florida, which is not true. So we use the same reasoning. If P, then Q, Q, therefore P. And we can see clearly that that is poor reasoning. In fact, it's a common logical fallacy known as affirming the consequent. Now, when we test arguments for validity, we use formal means, like truth tables, Venn diagrams, proofs. But since this is an ethics class, we won't go into the detail of those things. However, the critical thinking class that I teach covers this, and also, of course, the logic class covers it in considerable detail. So the first question to ask is, is the reasoning good? The second question is, are the premises true? Now, before getting to that, we'll consider the second type of argument, namely the inductive argument. Now, valid arguments and invalid arguments are deductive. With inductive arguments, they're technically invalid. Why? Because with an inductive argument, 
you could always have a case where all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false by their very nature. Because even if the premises are all true and the reasoning is good, it only gives you probability. So it's always possible to have an inductive argument with all true premises and a false conclusion. So because of this, we don't assess inductive arguments in terms of being valid or invalid. We assess them in terms of being strong or weak. Now a strong inductive argument is such that if the premises were true, then the conclusion is likely to be true. And a weak one is such that if the premises were true, then the conclusion is not likely to be true. Now in terms of like exactly what counts as being strong or weak, it's kind of fuzzy. So you have clear strong arguments and clear weak arguments, and then you kind of have a fuzzy zone. So for example, the example I gave earlier, namely, if we say, you know, premise one, 80% of all humans have brown eyes, then we conclude the next person that we meet will have brown eyes, it's a pretty strong argument. Because if it's true that 80% of humans have brown eyes, then there's you know, pretty much an 80% chance the next person you meet will have brown eyes. Now, if you have an argument like this, 80% of humans have brown eyes, therefore the next person I meet will have green eyes, that's obviously a pretty bad argument, because we know that 80% of humans have brown eyes, assuming that, then the odds of them having green eyes would be, you know, 20% or, you know, obviously less. So those would be clearly strong and clearly weak. Other arguments, though, not entirely clear. For example, Suppose you um, you like Apple, you know, products, and you bought you bought like a iPad, the iPad, you know, four. I guess they call it just the iPad, and you like it. And then you come out with the iPad five, and you say, well, you know, I like my previous you know, iPad, so I like the next one. Well, we don't have an exact probability on that. Maybe it's maybe it's you know you know probably going to be not particularly strong, but we don't have an exact probability. So in those cases, we don't have like an exact probability we have to rely on particular standards. So the inductive arguments, unlike deductive arguments, we don't assess them in, with truth tables, proofs, etc. We assess them by standards. So to use a crappy analogy, if doing deductive arguments is rather like doing math, where it's pretty clearly objectively correct or incorrect, inductive arguments are kind of like assessing, say, an Olympic sport like diving where there's some pretty clear standards. You know, if you a person is diving, they like hit the rocks, that's I assume that's some points off. But there is not like a clear, perfectly objective test. In contrast, something like track, where it's just a matter of, you know, physically, whoever crosses the line first and is not disqualified, they win. So when assessing the reasoning, the basic idea is is the argument deductive or inductive? If it's deductive, you decide whether it's valid or invalid. If it's inductive, you decide whether it's strong or weak. Now, the second question or consideration is this, namely the content. And the question is, are the premises true? Or at least plausible? Now, the reasoning, to use a crappy analogy, is like the assembling of something, the building of a house, or the cooking of food. So to use the analogy of, say, a meal, obviously the quality of the meal depends in part on how well it's prepared. So good reasoning is like good cooking. You know, you take the ingredients and prepare them well. But of course, cooking a good meal is not just a matter of having the cooking skills and cooking well, it also involves the quality of the ingredients. And so we have to assess that as well. Now, the question here is again, are the premises true or at least plausible? And a good question is, how do you tell? Well, basically, there's three sort of tests. One is, does the premise, the claim made in the premise, does it match your own observations? If the answer is yes, that adds to its plausibility. If the answer is no, and assuming it's something that can be observed, then it lowers its plausibility. But of course, our observations could be wrong. Secondly, does the premise have consistency with our own background information 
and experience. If the answer is yes, that increases its plausibility. If the answer is no, that decreases it. But of course, our background information or experience could be an error, but it's a good, good test. And finally, there's a question of whether the premise is consistent with credible sources, such as you know, objective reliable experts, standard references, textbooks, etc. If the answer is yes, that's a, you know, clearly a point in its favor. If the answer is no, that's clearly a minus. But once again, something could match the opinion of experts and established authority and turn out to be wrong. Something could be against established authority and turn out to be right. But those are three pretty good tests. Does it match your observations, your background information, and does it match up against other credible sources? To the degree yes, it's a plus. To the degree no, a minus. So getting back to the analogy about, about you know, food and cooking, the reasoning is like assessing the quality of the cooking, how well is prepared. And assessing the premises is like assessing the quality of the ingredients, how good, how fresh, and how nutritious are they. So for example, just as someone could cook very well with poor ingredients, you know, someone could be a, a very good cook, but you know, not have much to work with, and they could have poor ingredients, the meal would be well assembled, but have poor content. Or, of course, you could have someone who's got poor cooking skills, but has the finest ingredients, and the meal, of course, won't be particularly good. And, of course, you can have where both are good. You know, someone who's got good cooking skills, assembles a meal well, and has good ingredients. And you can have something that's, you know, really bad. Someone assembles the meal poorly, you know, burns it, mis you know, doesn't mix the ingredients properly, and the ingredients are kind of bad. So you can have all those combinations. So those are the basics for arguments. The key concepts are argument itself, which is a set of claims, one of which is supposed to fall from the others. The claim that's supposed to be supported is known as a conclusion, and argument is one and only one of those. And it's supported by the premises, and there can be as many of these as needed. Arguments break down to the deductive arguments, which can be valid or invalid, and inductive arguments, which can be strong or weak. And we also assess arguments in terms of the quality of the reasoning, and in terms of whether the premises are true or at least plausible. Now what if you've got good reasoning and true premises? Well, if you have a deductive argument, it gets a special name, namely a sound argument. And that just means the argument is deductive, it's valid, it's got all true premises. And since valid means if all the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Uh, sorry, the, then it follows that since you have all true premises, you've got a true conclusion. With inductive arguments, if you have all true premises, then the conclusion is probably true, and that's called a cogent argument. So that brings us to the end of sort of the first basics of arguments.